Thank you, and uh, thank you to the organizers for giving me the great pleasure to give this talk and to especially to present these results uh, with especially this chairperson. <laughs> and um, so I take the presentation in a, in a broader perspective just because it's convenient to sort of show you that these inequalities are good for something. So let me start briefly by explaining that they connect with a, a broad, more general problem, uh, which is to, to study uh, almost unconditional convergence. When you just have a sequence of vectors in a Banach space and you just choose the signs independently at random, and you consider the, the, the question to, you want to know when this series converges for almost all choices of signs. So it's a very old problem, very classical, and lots of names should be uh, quoted, in particular Salem, Zygmunt, Pele, <coughs> and uh, many other names. And uh, so, you know, if you want to formalize a little bit, then you introduce classically the, the random variables, which I will denote epsilon n, which are a sequence, uh, IID sequence of random signs with, of course, uh, uniform probability. So we want to know when this sequence converges almost surely. So in the scalar case, the answer was given by uh, Kinshin, well, maybe Kinshin Kolmogorov, I'm not sure about the history, but it's usually the name of Kinshin that, that we mention here. So the answer with scalar coefficients is if and only if the scalar coefficients are in L2. This is the same, of course, as by orthogonality as convergence in L2 of the series. But which is less trivial is it's equivalent to convergence in LP for any P between 0 and infinity. And so the Kinchin inequalities uh, are the inequalities that uh, correspond to this phenomenon. If you consider a finite sum, so from now on I will always write inequalities with finite sums. So you consider a finite sum, I don't worry about convergence, but it's guaranteed if this is finite anyway. Uh, the LP norm is equivalent to the L2 norm of such a sum, and the, the constants actually are known. I didn't write them, but the, the exact value of these constants are known. This was uh, done, this work was done by Sharek and, and later by, by Hagerup. Uh, two constants are, are trivial because, of course, as you know, when P is more than 2, the LP norm is more than the L2 norm, and reverse when P is less than 2. So some cases are obvious, but it's nicer to write it in this symmetric form like this. So these are the Kinchin inequalities. Now, when you are considering Banach space, uh, well, uh, a Banach space which is not a Hilbert space, then orthogonality doesn't help you very much. And uh, the substitute uh, uh, for the Kinchin inequalities are inequalities due to Kahan that are, have been very important in the, in the subject and very useful. Let's say that the LQ norm and the LP norm for any values of P and Q are equivalent. And so the scalar case is included in there because if you choose in the scalar case one of the two indices to be 2, it tells you the L2 norm is equivalent to the LP norm. But now Banach spaces is no reason to work with uh, P equals 2. It's not privileged in any way. And these inequalities of Kahan express uh, a, a very uh, surprising phenomenon which it generalizes the Kinchin phenomenon that the series converges almost surely in the Banach space B, arbitrary Banach space, if and only if they converge in LP of B for any P finite. For some P or for all P, it's the same. Okay, they converge together. So again, uh, the problem is, is reduced to uh, a, a, a problem of inequalities, right? So our initial question to, to understand when the series converges almost surely, 
Actually, you understand now, because of these Kahan inequalities, that it boils down to uh, proving <coughs> an inequality that tells us to what such a norm is equivalent. And on top of that, we have an advantage, which I will immediately exploit, which is that we can choose P, because actually, for any P, you know, they're going to be equivalent. So we can choose the P for the calculation. Now, I, I should mention, just to be complete, that uh, in fact, this, this problem in the very abstract and general uh, case uh, has progressed uh, recently, in fact, uh, spectacularly with work of Latawa and Bed North. But I, I, this is not the direction that I want to take in this, in this talk. So it's, uh, there's a long story there that actually <laughs> goes back to also random Fourier series. Uh, in the Gaussian case, there's important work of Fernick uh, that uh, somehow I also don't want to mention, and work of Marcus and myself and that Talagrand continued. And uh, recently, Latawa and Bed North actually obtained also a characterization, an answer to the question. There is now an answer to the question, which is, is very surprising in this generality. There's an answer, not for any B, but when B is just L infinity, there is an answer with uh, the choices of sign. There was an answer by Talagrand before in the Gaussian case. That's the connection, and now there's an answer to that. So in case you're interested, I could say more. But this is not my subject. The subject of the talk is really to concentrate on Banach spaces B, which have more structure. So here, this is, you know, so if you have more structure, then uh, what you expect, of course, is to find an answer to the question that you can compute. You want to be able to, to compute what, you know, your, your necessary and sufficient condition to find something uh, more concrete. So what I'm, uh, what I, to, to explain what, I'm, what, I'm, what, what is my goal, let me first consider the case, simple case of LP. So the Banach space B is now LP itself. So of course, if B is LP, now it's better not to choose P equals 2, but to choose P equals P <laughs> for the, the moments, Q equals P if you like, and estimate the LP norm uh, of our series with values in B in LP with values in B. And now LP of LP, of course, is LP over the product measure space. So very simple things uh, happen. And so the answer is that the series converges almost surely in B, if and only if this is finite. And this is computable, because this is just B is LP, so that's just computing this integral in LP of the square function. So this is, of course, absolutely classical fact. Uh, what I now want to, to discuss is the non-commutative case of, of this result. And the non-commutative case of this result is the non-commutative uh, Kinshin inequalities. So now we replace our LP space, classical LP space, by a non-commutative LP space. And in the most general case, this is uh, defined as associated to a Feynman algebra equipped with a, what I will call loosely a standard trace, satisfying the usual assumptions. And in this audience, it's quite possible that uh, you're not familiar with that degree of generality. In that case, no problem. Just consider that this is, I'm talking about the Shatten P class. So every time that I say LP of tau, you take tau to be the usual trace over B of H, and the LP of tau is just the Shatten P class, okay? So that means that uh, the norm, <laughs> the P norm, is just, the P norm of an operator is just the trace of T star T P over two, <coughs> one over P. And in fact, if uh, the Shatten P class uh, you know, you are not comfortable, you can even take uh, this definition on matrices, just T can now be just a matrix, and the only thing to keep in mind is that we want inequalities independent of the size of the matrix. So all the constants must be independent of the size of the matrix. And then, uh, what I'm going to say, anyway, essentially everything is already uh, you know, is already interesting in this case. It's already, the main case really is the matrix case. 
So what happens in the non-commutative case is that we still can consider the square function because we, we have a substitute for the modulus. We write the modulus like this. And uh, the surprise is that when we consider now the same thing, the square function and the norm of the square function in our space B, which is now our non-commutative LP, then these uh, square functions for Xn and for the adjoint, they are not equivalent norms. But <coughs> the, the LP norm, the norm of, of this expression, LP is first over the average over the signs, and then here you have the norm of B, which is uh, this LP norm. This is a self-adjoint norm. These non-commutative LP spaces, they are self-adjoint spaces. The Shatton P class is a self-adjoint space. This is classical. So there's a problem there if we want to write the same thing. So the non-commutative Kinchin inequalities, which are due to Françoise Picard from a, a note to Contrendu in 1986, say that uh, we have essentially an analog of the Kinchin inequalities, which uh, now should be written like this. Uh, the, the, the norm that we want is, is a two-sided equivalence with a norm which I write as a, a triple indexed P, triple norm. And the big surprise is that in the non-commutative case, the case P more than two and the case P less than two have to be written separately, or I wrote them actually together, but the, the result, the, the equivalent term, doesn't have the same form. And so the case P more than two in some sense is simpler, but this is a bit misleading to say that because actually they are symmetric, okay? But it is simpler because you see it's just the maximum of the, of the two norms that I've already highlighted as not equivalent. So you, you have to write it like that, they are not equivalent. So if I write just one term, it's false, okay? So you need the two terms here, the max of these two terms, and it's simpler also because, uh, so I insist that they are not equivalent, so of course you're thinking, but, but then if we take xk self-adjoint, then of course they are the same. So then we get back to the situation before and we write an inequality that's really similar to Kinchin, but that's, that's only in the self-adjoint case, so in the real case. So we could do this, but if we do this, that doesn't help for the case P less than two. The case P less than two, we won't be able to write it even in the self-adjoint case without uh, having the, the same uh, complication here. Complication, which is not a big deal, is that this max of two terms becomes an infimum over all decompositions of the sequence XK uh, as a sum of two terms, and it's the infimum of uh, terms which are controlled, the first one with the square function usual and the other one with the adjoint, the square function of the adjoints of the elements. So you can sort of, depending on how you like it, you could write it with just with one, and one norm and then ak plus bk star and then you would have the same norm. It's a matter of taste really. Okay, so uh, the the result for P more than two and for P uh, between um, one and two, so I think I, I didn't really mean to write it like that immediately, but uh, let me observe that the case uh, these cases okay, maybe I will concentrate on P between one and two. So, so these cases obviously are in duality. And uh, let me just point out that indeed uh, there are general results from actually general Barnack space theory that say that uh, uh, you should expect that these norms, the, the triple norms that appear a priori by a priori arguments, you, can, you could predict that they must be dual to each other. And what I want to emphasize here is that indeed they are, they are dual to each other <coughs> uh, because you see that uh, the unit ball of uh, this norm here is the intersection of two balls and what is written here, this, this uh, infimum, is actually the gauge of the convex hull of the two dual balls. 
So in fact, the, the expression here is precisely the dual norm to this one. Okay, now I've anticipated a little bit. This is the presentation of the Kinchin inequalities, and yes, okay, it's written here. Now, the, the, the different cases, well, uh, we, we worked together with Françoise from the beginning uh, after she proved this, and then uh, we proved uh, the case P equals 1. 1991, we, we have a paper where we have two proofs, which I think have, each have their own interests, but uh, one of them uh, shows that the case P equals 1 is closely related to the, uh, what I now call the, the little non-commutative Grothendieck inequality. Now, <laughs> of course, to say that two results are equivalent when they both are correct is <laughs> always a, a little bit silly, but uh, what we mean is that we, we, we found a way to pass from one to the other by, by very, you know, smooth kind of very transparent argument. So in, in that sense, uh, but that produced also the first proof for P equals one, actually. So it, it's not obvious, but the, the passage is uh, smooth. Uh, we, we, we feel we understand it very well. Uh, for instance, you know, you could apply this. This result can be applied. Actually, the preceding talk <laughs> gave an example of application of the result. Uh, the, the, what Pierre Youssef actually used is a little more, which I did not emphasize, which is that uh, the constant alpha p here, when p tends to infinity, is of order square root of p, which is something that, that we noticed uh, later. So, an example of application, just very, very simple. You give yourself a scalar matrix Xij, and now you, you, you attribute to it signs chosen at random, completely at random, okay, over the, the, the places Ij. All, so, all the entries have independent signs. Question, when is this almost surely in the Shatton P class? Okay, when do you have almost surely this finite for this random matrix. And so the, the inequalities are actually, this was probably Françoise Picard's uh, earliest motivation uh, for her inequalities. The answer is for P more than two, uh, this very simple condition, but where you have to require a condition like this for the matrix and the same condition for the transpose matrix, and when p is less than 2, you have no choice. You have to consider this formulation with decomposition because that's if and only if, and the, the, the other condition becomes not the right one. We, we, it's clear we have counterexamples. So for p strictly less than 2, the condition is you should have a decomposition, xij like this, such that, again, the first term is like this, and the second term is it's the same, but for the transpose condition, where the sums in i and j now are, are interchanged. And the, the, of course, the proof of, of this application is just that you apply the inequality to this series. Okay, formally, this this random uh, matrix is just uh, eij being the usual basis. This is this element, and so you, all you have to do is compute this triple norm for this element and. When, when, when you look at the way that EIJ uh, product EKL, you know, what is the result of the product of the matrix units, which is a, a classical calculation, you very easily find this answer here. So what I mean by this is that this has concrete applications, it's not just the pleasure of generalizing uh, Kinchin inequalities. Uh, a quick digression, there's, there's a case, which is the case that I'm going to concentrate on, which is P less than 2, okay, I'll concentrate on P less than 2. A general remark is that these LP and non-commutative LP uh, belong to the family of cotype 2 spaces, which are spaces that satisfy this inequality, which is something that uh, actually has been studied uh, for a, for a long time, <coughs> in particular in early work of, of Moray, and it's known it has connections with Grothendieck's inequality. Uh, you see, it, 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 it's a, a, it gives a, a nice necessary condition in general. When this series converges almost surely in B, then automatically uh, the sum of the norm square is finite. 
But this necessary condition, in general, is not sufficient. It's sufficient if and only if the space B is isomorphic to Hilbert space. So, so, so it's only one side, you know, which is nice, and you don't have a, a, an equivalence. What, what we want to is have an answer to our question. We want to have an answer by an equivalence. We want to compute an equivalent to this norm. However, this is a nice class, and we'll be working in this class, P less than 2. So, surprisingly, the case P between 0 and 1 actually uh, remained open. We were stuck uh, with Francoise, we didn't see what to do, and I've actually advertised this problem quite often for uh, all these years. And uh, in a few years ago, in a paper in JFA 2009, uh, I decided, well, probably a couple of years before that, okay, that's it, I want to do it, let's finish this, let's clean up the, you know, the slate, we'll do the case P less than one. And so I worked very hard, I managed to produce a couple of false proofs, and then I gave up and I wrote the paper with what I had, and I had, well, some results here and there, so I could have enough to write a paper, but I was very, very bitter, I didn't get the problem, which was motivation for the paper. So what was the approach in the paper? The approach was, and it relates to, it's an approach to use extrapolation, it relates to ideas that I have used many times in other contexts, and goes back to uh, Moret, who used this for the first time to prove, to give a new proof of the classical Grothendieck inequality. And it's, it's the following. So uh, I, I, I look at the Kinchin inequality, I want to label them. So now I call them KP. So KP for me means the Kinchin inequality uh, in non-commutative LP. Okay, so B is the Shatton P class. And then we look at this inequality, but I now concentrate on just one side because we're in the situation with P less than two where Turns out, I won't explain why, so it's not completely trivial, but the other side is easy. So we have the other side, say, for free, more or less. And so this is, the, this is really the problem. The problem is to know whether when this converges, we can automatically decompose Xn into these two parts, which in some sense converge obviously. Okay? So there is, this, is, this is the difficulty, to show that this converges because of this decomposition. So it's formulated uh, quantitatively in this, uh, incorporated in this inequality. So the, the extrapolation means simply that we, we, would, we would like to show that the, the, the inequality KQ implies the inequality KP when P is less than Q. And uh, in fact, there's, there's an analogy, uh, those of you who are familiar with the, the theory of Rudin's lambda P set, maybe remember that you know, it's a, <coughs> there's, there's a classical extrapolation trick in Rudin's old paper, where he shows that you know, lambda Q sets are lambda P sets when P is less than Q. So it's a, it's a similar idea that one needs here, but, but the norms involved, because of, of this expression here, the norms involved do, do not uh, immediately produce, uh, as you will see, uh, the, the, the ingredients for, for this idea to actually work out. Um, before I forget, let me mention that uh, I'm here concentrating on Kinchin's inequality with the random choices of signs, so that's just the simplest thing to discuss. But actually, the, the idea that I'm going to show and the, the, the result, in fact, is more general. So it applies to, to more general sequences than the sequence epsilon n. You can take for epsilon n, basically, any sequence which is uh, dominated, which is, let's say, orthonormal in L2, and which uh, satisfies uh, something like this KQ, some lower bound like that, then automatically uh, this will work. And so we, we have examples of that, lacunary series work, uh, Adama lacunary series work, <coughs> other types in the commutative in terms of random variables, but also, and this is 
actually quite interesting when you accept to go inside the, the, the philosophy of free probability, if you, you know what it is, which is some kind of uh, limit behavior of random matrices when the size goes to infinity, then there is a, an analog of free Rademacher random variables, an analog of free you know, independent choices of signs, freely independent choices of signs, and the surprise is the same inequality is true. It's actually non-trivial, there is no a priori reason why this should be true, and I think that this is something interesting and which maybe will have uh, some, some importance, but it's, it's just a, a slightly surprising fact. All these sequences actually give you know, the same inequalities, the same necessary and sufficient condition for convergence. So in this commutative setting that I mentioned now, this product epsilon and xn, which so far is just pointwise product, will become a, a tensor product, and epsilon n can be a, a, a non-commutative random variable, that means it can be a, an operator or a random operator or even operator associated to uh, some other trace with which we do uh, the, the, the product with our trace tau. But let me stop in that direction, and that's just uh, pointing, pointing that there, there's something more general that is being proved here. So the key ingredient uh, for the proof turns out to be uh, a form of uh, non-commutative Hölder inequality. So the, the key ingredient in this uh, approach of extrapolation is, is this. So I, I, I introduced the, the product, which I, I will denote like that, JXY is the uh, Jordan product. Sh should I say Jordan? I'm not sure. Jordan, which, which, which Jordan is it? Huh? Ah bon? C'est pas roumain? Je crois que c'était Jordan roumain. Donc je vais. I'll say Jordan product, I don't know. So, you know, this related to this. This, this symmetrized product is related to the theory of Jordan algebras and so on. And the, the, the difficulty here in everything that uh, comes next is that precisely we don't have a left multiplication or a right multiplication, but the sum of the left and right multiplication. And this is what we have to deal with, okay? This is the, the big technical problem. So for instance, I, uh, I introduce, I, I will now fix P, and P is my target. I want to prove the inequalities for P, starting from Q, which is larger. And so I, I introduce a, 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 a strange quantity here, CQ of X, which is the, the infimum over all densities. So densities are something strictly positive with integral one or trace one, okay? So, so that's probability densities is what I mean. And I, I look at the following. So I look at the, this inverse of the operation of Jordan multiplication by this guy here, which is obviously normalized in some LR with a special value of R applied to my sum, and then I take the LQ norm with respect to the, the product of the probability over the signs and uh, the trace tau. So uh, I, I'm taking some liberties, but since this is strictly positive, it can be shown that this is injective, so I can indeed invert this operator. It, it, it's, it's okay, okay? So if, if, I, if I write the, the inverse here, since I'm only, this density is only on the operator side, it, it, it does nothing to the signs, okay? So it's, it's, it's deterministic, it's not random. So this thing multiplies, this acts on the xn. So this, uh, if, if I write this expression, it will automatically be uh, also uh, a, a, a series with the choices of signs, because this, this is just, a, there are no signs here, okay? So I can write it formally like that, and it means that xn is, uh, given like this with respect to, to yn. So uh, I repeated here uh, the, what, what we are after. So this expression CQ is uh, given by that. And now Q is going to, to be between P and 2. Okay, so I said my goal is P, and then Q is between P and 2. 
So uh, the extreme cases are that CP of X, you see, if I, if I now take CP of X, so Q is P, so this disappears, it's very simple, I get LP over the, the product, okay? And C2, C2, uh, now this is, this is less clear, but it turns out that, you know, C2, now Q is replaced by 2, and you can expect that now we can compute everything very simply because the L2 norm, now we use orthogonality, the L2 norm just computes out with the sum of the squares of the coefficient, and some, this requires actually an argument, but it turns out it's easy, and uh, it's part of the motivation for introducing this. The C2 of X norm, uh, so the result of this when Q is equal to 2 actually is what we want. It is this triple P norm. Okay, so the, the method, uh, uh, the principle of extrapolation is, is, is based on some extremely simple idea, which is this. You, you, want to, to sh you need to show that you have a certain form of holder inequality for your norms here, CQ. So just assume with me that we have this. Let's assume that we have this holder inequality, and let's, let's see uh, why the result follows, okay? Well, we, we start from uh, KQ. We want to show that KQ implies KP. So KQ, we apply KQ to the Y that was before. So the Y is this series here with this inverse. This is sum of epsilon n, Yn. So I get that by KQ, I get that the, the, the Y triple Q norm is less than this expression here. And then I, I choose, of course, I, I, this, this here, uh, I, perhaps I should remind you what is written here, okay? So you have that this is, this is what we do. We use this Y here. So if you're still with me, so we use the, this Y. Now we, I choose, of course, the F, uh, which up to a factor, it doesn't matter, up to a factor 2. All, all this is the constants, I'm not careful with the constants, so up to a factor 2, it realizes this inf, okay? And so I will get that uh, this expression here, this CQ, uh, th this expression, something with, with YN, realizes CQX. This is the, what realizes this infimum. So it is less by the interpolation argument than this. <coughs> and uh, by KQ, it dominates YQ. Now there's a sub lemma on which I will say very little, but just a, a little word that, that says that uh, you can actually show that the YQ norm dominates again the triple P norm. And this is this sub lemma, I call it like that because it, it's, it's reasonably easy. And so the conclusion of the principle is that the triple P norm is dominated by CPX 1 minus theta times the triple P norm again that appears. So it seems we are doing something wrong because we have this, this now in, in the upper bound. We want it in the lower bound. But notice that we have it as an upper bound with this coefficient theta, which is strictly between 0 and 1. So now, all the sums can be finite, so everything is finite. I can divide by this and then take the power 1 over 1 minus theta, and I get uh, the inequality. I get the inequality that this is less than this. That's it. That's, that's what we want, because CP, CPX, this extreme case, was the good norm that we want to, uh, to show dominates this triple P norm. So that's, that's the principle, and then the sublemma, so I just wanted to, to mention an ingredient, so the sublemma I said is easy, but actually is, is not entirely obvious. It's, you still have to worry about the fact that you have this left and right multiplications, but there are very classical uh, ways to deal with this using the, the three-line lemma, and it's known that basically in certain situations your, your left and right Multiplications can be grouped into fully one on the left, one fully on the right, and that's what's involved here. So it's easy. Let, let me just skip. So the main point is this Holder inequality. And now by uh, massaging this, uh, this expression with uh, the norm CQ, it, it turns out that, uh, in fact, I can uh, uh, re reduce uh, the situation to to uh, an ordinary Holder inequality just with weights. So, so 
uh, this, I, I wrote one star, the, the inequality that makes everything works, and now I'm saying that it's easy to actually uh, show that it suffices to have this inequality that's much more innocent because uh, you see that the JF is just left and right multiplication, but other than that, it's the LQ norm. And we have that same multiplication here, P and 2, and uh, <coughs> theta gives us Q, uh, 1 over Q as a barycenter of 1 over P and 1 over 2. So it's very similar to Holder. And in fact, if you want to, just for clarity, if you, it's best maybe to review quickly the commutative case. So in the commutative case, then of course we have no problem with left and right, so we can make all sorts of simple adjustment. And it turns out that the CQ of X norm is, is the following. It's the norm in LP of the measure, which now replaces the trace, M replaces the trace, of the LQ norm over the signs here. So it's an LP of LQ norm. It's absolutely standard that these norms that are sometimes called uh, mixed norms, LP of LQ norms are sometimes called mixed norms. Classical that this uh, works for complex interpolation perfectly well, and so you have the, the neatest inequality like this, which is valid, and there's no problem with going to P less than two because that, that works just as well, okay? And in fact, the classical Kinchin inequality, as I've recalled uh, in the beginning, uh, you know, uh, tells you that this CQ is in fact, uh, is in fact actually for any Q uh, that we considered, uh, in fact for more, but for, for all these Qs, it's equivalent to the term we want. It's equivalent to the triple P norm, which is actually what the extrapolation proof shows in the end. So, uh, so let me return to this uh, Holder type inequality, which is the heart of the matter. So now our problem is to show this. We have to show that uh, if f is in the unit ball of LR and positive, so I'm just rescaling with the power, so the density f is now taken to the power 1 over r, and then I call this capital F. So the inequality is now like this. It's important that this should be in the ball. So there is an important normalization. Otherwise, at some point, you're going to ob object that I'm writing nonsense. So you have to remember this is normalized. So I remind you here that, of course, the product is like this. And then, uh, even for P uh, more than 1, this is, this is not so obvious for, for matrices in the matrix case. But we have a, a very useful tool, which is the triangle projection, which is the analog of the Hilbert transform uh, in a non-commutative setting, which is the projection from matrices to uh, upper triangular matrices or lower triangular matrices, and it's bounded from LP to LP, and of weak type 1, 1. And so if you use that, actually, you, you can show that this inequality holds, but this is, argument is an argument that actually works only for p more than 1. That's why I was stuck, really, with the case p superior or equal to 1. And the triangle projection, it's well known, is unbounded for p less than 1, so uh, it seemed uh, rather, rather hopeless. So it's simple in p more than 1, because in fact, what happens, it's a, a result that's of independent interest, so maybe I should mention it in passing, that using this triangular projection, one can show that actually the, this Jordan uh, product is in fact, it decomposes. That's why everything becomes much simpler. It decomposes simply as the, the sum of the norms of the left product and the right product. And once you have separated the two products, then you, you're back into a very easy situation. So you have no problem to, to apply standard methods. Okay, so now the case P between 0 and 1. So as I said, I, 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 I could not prove this. I was stuck. I could only check it for P more than 1. And uh, however, I did something very, very good in the paper, which is that I decided to write 
what was you know the, the the weakest condition what was the weakest absolutely the weakest thing that made the the proof work that made the principle work and the weakest thing is that you don't really need an exponent a theta all you need is is this you know sort of weak form of interpolation type argument holder type uh, argument you know, like this, it's important, and no need to have any estimate on the, the weight W delta. All you need is that this tends to zero, but it has to be in a uniform way over the size of the matrix, over, you know, everything. If you have this, then the proof works, and it's easy, it's the same, same argument. But this, uh, I, was, I was still stuck, because, uh, in fact, I, I couldn't prove this, and, you know, Honestly, I was rather, you know, the usual thing, you work very hard on a problem, then you lose hope, and I was demoralized, and I started thinking, well, you know, maybe this is not true, and so on. And then, in the fall of 2014, so about uh, a little less than a year ago, I think, or about a year ago, uh, I received an email message from Eric Ricard, who told me, but this is obviously true. So I uh, was quite a shock, you know, and uh, <laughs> I have to admit that at first I didn't quite believe it. And he said, this is obviously true. Look, uh, uh, just by ultra product, uh, one can show that, in fact, uh, this must be true for some W delta tending to zero, but without absolutely any estimate on the rate, but by an a priori ultra product argument, one could show this. Now, uh, the reason why I, I didn't believe him immediately is that, in fact, when you're, when you, the problem here is a matrix problem. You have to show this inequality just for matrices, you know, in the, the, the simplest case. But even for matrices, since you want the size of the matrix to be arbitrarily large, an ultra product argument will be an ultra product of matrices with large size tending to infinity and with a weight. And then you end up in the, the phenomenon algebras that are called of type 3, where you absolutely don't have a trace, and you have to, to work with certain techniques which are uh, sometimes uh, uh, tricky. But uh, Eric Ricard turns out to be an expert in the, this area, so after uh, you know, the usual exchange of messages, he convinced me that, yes, he's right. But then, he was showing, his argument was showing there is an estimate, and now, you know, there is a holder type inequality of some form which we should find. So, of course, we got to work together, and we uh, worked together on, well, what is the damn inequality that is behind this? And so we found it. Uh, we found uh, an inequality with a, a strange exponent. We don't know if the exponent is the best or, or not, but uh, here is what it is. It's, it's essentially the same inequality that uh, you know, I presented before, except that now the exponent is not the right theta that we had before, but it's another one, theta prime which is any theta prime such that uh, this number here falls less than uh, <laughs> 1 minus theta times p over 2. So the, the, that, that factor 2 is, uh, is strange, but it is really linked to the, the technique we used. Uh, it's, it's too soon, frankly, to know if uh, there is a chance that... Uh, this could be improved to theta prime equals theta. We, we, I think we don't think that theta prime equals theta will be true, but maybe any 1 minus theta prime less than 1 minus theta is probably likely to be true. We, we really don't have the, the right counterexamples to, at hand to do this. So, uh, application, well, the, 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 the attempt that I had uh, and that uh, didn't go through now goes through, and so we have that the non-commutative Kinshin inequalities are, are true for any P between 0 and 1. So, in fact, the, the Holder inequality uh, is true, of course, more generally. The, the same technique uh, works with... Uh, uh, something else than L2 at the end of the interpolation scale. So we can take, in fact, any P, Q, and S, and P goes uh, all the way to, to zero. We even can put some unitaries in front of the, the, the weights F, and so the inequality is like this. 
this, is, this looks just formally more general. There is an interest, though, which is a bit surprising, is that we actually can put the minus sign just as well. So, of course, if we put the minus sign here, then we have to put it on the right-hand side. Otherwise, you know, we, we would just be separating left and right. So we don't separate left and right multiplication, but we have that even with the commutator, we have these inequalities, and they, they seem to be non-trivial just as well for this case, uh, where now this Jordan product becomes a commutator. Okay. And uh, it has a, 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 an amusing application because it turns out that actually Ricard had been working just a year before on a, a, a problem for which the, the, the new Holder inequality was exactly what he was missing to extend again to p less than 1, a result that he had uh, proved. So it's about the, the Mazur map. So the Mazur map is uh, a, a very simple map that transforms LP into LQ uh, isometrically by just doing, you know, the, the, obvious, the obvious thing so that uh, the uh, LP norm of F becomes uh, the LQ norm of this expression. If I, if I have it, if I didn't get mixed up in the formula, that you should immediately yourself see that the LQ norm of this is the LP norm of, of F. So, this is a map that goes from the unit sphere to the unit sphere. And uh, it's, it was known that this is a uniform homeomorphism. It's a nonlinear map, obviously a nonlinear map. This was due to Renault from a few years ago, Yves Renault. And the natural question was, well, it's a uniform homeomorphism, but what estimate do you have in terms of, uh, uh, I don't know, I usually say gamma Lipschitz, but I think it's more proper to say gamma Holder. So it's Holderian of degree gamma, or of exponent gamma, maybe is the proper terminology. So the question is, for which gamma, given, given P and Q, for which gamma is this map uh, holder of exponent gamma? And so Eric, had, uh, Eric Ricard had uh, solved this problem for PQ more than one, and he had found this exponent. But he was similarly stuck, as for the Kinchin inequalities, we were for the, he was similarly stuck for the case p less than one and didn't have any estimate. So now it turns out that the, the Holder inequality, the previous one, is exactly what is needed. Now you have to take both sides, <coughs> plus one and minus one, and he had noticed in his paper on this that, in fact, if you have this inequality here, with all the conditions on phi, so phi is normalized in LP, X is self-adjoint in the unit sphere of L infinity. So I, one term is, it disappears because the infinity norm is one, so you don't have a one minus gamma term. If you have this, then the map is from P to Q is holder of exponent gamma. So this was particularly satisfying for us because it gave us an application, perhaps some justification for, you know, all these uh, efforts uh, we made in uh, in a different direction, which is this uh, this Mazur map. So then uh, it follows that uh, the Mazur map we have an estimate on the gamma for which it is Holderian for any uh, p and q. It's a bit messy, but okay, there is some answer now that extends his result to all values of p and q between zero and infinity, since we, we, we don't have to stop now at p more than one. So uh, I think I've stopped uh, something. It's not the version that, uh, <laughs> that I had in mind, actually, uh, something, or maybe I, I passed on one. Uh, one screen because I wanted to give a, an idea of uh, the, the trick that we use or the method we use. So obviously we use uh, complex variable methods. As you know, LP for P less than one is not locally convex, but it's known that non-commutative LP or, or commutative <laughs> LP have, have a norm which uh, is nicely subharmonic. It satisfies nice inequalities related to subharmonicity. And in fact, more generally, there is a very nice property of LP for P uh, 
<coughs> less than, than 2 positive, which, is, uh, which we call complex uniform convexity. It's something which is analogous to uniform convexity, except though in uniform convexity you, you average uh, something like x plus minus y, and here you, you would average, you would look at a x plus sum of zn, xn, <coughs> yn, n positive, and, uh, and try to, you know, make similar considerations analogous to what you do with uniform convexity. So this is a, a theory that has been developed previously. In particular, what I'm writing here is, is due to, to Juan Hua Xu, and this is a, a key ingredient to prove our, our, our new form of Holder's inequality. With this, I'll stop here. Thank you very much.